I took Shalman Rushdie's masterclass on writing, so you don't have to. Thank you. And today I'll be going over some of the key concepts from the course so we can all become better writers and readers. Welcome to Write Conscious, where we cover everything book and writing related. We are not another superficial booktube channel. Ah! We do deep dives into the greatest books and authors and find actionable content in their work so we can transform our own art and mind and thus change the world. So let's get started with the most potent content in this course, and it is Shalman Rushdie's seven tips for writers. And after that, we'll be going over four tips for editing and Shalman Rushdie's beautiful book recommendation list. It is actually the best one I've ever seen from an author, and I have a lot to say about it. So the first tip is, are you a maximalist or are you a minimalist? Rushdie takes the stance that there is no middle ground, that you either need to be capturing everything with your book, a whole glimpse of reality, or just a very small sliver of it. And I've noticed with a lot of my writing students that the more creative, rebellious types tend toward maximalism, and the more focused, organized types tend to write very linear and condensed novels. One isn't better than the other, but you need to find and figure out your strength. And it, and it can change book from book. But if we look at Rushdie's novels, for example, we see that he tends toward maximalism, maximalism. Midnight's Children and the Satanic Verses, according to him and when you read them, are very wide-ranging novels. And with all these tips, just sit with them. You don't need to make drastic changes, but these certain decisions and polarities that we're, and a couple more that we'll talk about are important for you figuring out your path as a writer and what your strengths are. And if you want to write to your weaknesses, then you may need to bring in some more help. You may need to imitate or get more editing done. Recruit some friends who are better at that weakness than you are. The second tip is another classic polarity for writers. Are you a pantser or are you a plotter? Rushdie for most of his novels was a plotter. And it wasn't very thorough, but it was thorough enough for him to have a whole outline and a lot of the scenes flushed out before he even started writing the novel. And there was some also also some deep characterization done before he started writing. And I don't really believe in this concept because it's just, the most important thing is just getting the first draft done. The first draft can be seen as a very advanced outline or a plot because if you aren't really editing your work and taking the time to do multiple drafts and you're not really a writer at all. I know the whole Kindle graveyard and now anyone can be a writer phenomenon has shaken the writing world, but most great books and most great writers spend thousands of hours on one book. And those great works, most of the time, had axiomatic roots in them imitating or finding inspiration from other authors that they probably spent another thousand hours analyzing. But now, you know, you do National Novel Writing Month, you maybe revise that draft, hand it off to your friends, revise what they say, and release it. And so once again, if you just complete your first draft, you are already done plotting. And honestly, I really prefer the pantsing method, at least most of the time, because if you plot out your novel, and I have before, you're still going to write a really crappy rough draft, uh, excuse me, first draft. It's going to be better, for sure. It's going to be a little bit more coherent and better. But I'm not looking for coherent and better during my first draft. Third tip on the list is write what you feel is important, what is necessary. And once again, so many people shy away from this. So many people don't want to confront themselves, their stories, their trauma. I mean, look what just happened to Salman Rushdie. He confronted Islam and he got stabbed. You can't be afraid though. The most important thing for you to do is to dive into the taboos. And that's a very relative thing. Your taboo may be something very small, but when you enter into that zone, when you do as tip number four states, which is basically the same as this, work close to the bull. That means that, you know, it was a bullfight. He used a bullfighting analogy that you want to work close and be close to the bull for the show. You have to take risks because if the bullfighter is really far away from the bull, no one cares. You have to be on the leading ed edge of social issues or whatever political or philosophical issue that you're dealing with. And now that's getting crazier and crazier for authors. Because as we saw with Rishi, for example, if you want to be on the cutting edge of a novel that involves gender, then you may piss off a ton of people on either side of the political aisle. If you, a novel with a bunch of, with a trans protagonist and, and trans characters, obviously people on the right are going to give you pushback. And if you write a novel with very classic gender archetypes and stereotypes, you're going to get pushback from the left. And people, for instance, in the gender community on both sides are getting more radicalized and militant. And you could look at mo a lot of different issues like that. But obviously, you could, there's a million different things to pick from. Great example of this was Kasha Ishiguru's recent book, uh, Clara and the Sun. That was a huge commentary on AI and robots. And that may not seem very risky, but for someone like Kasha Ishiguru, who's been, all his characters have been really based in the human reality and moving into more of a 
sci-fi text and writing from first person point of view from a, a, a robot, that is that is working close to the bull. You have to figure out what it is for you. And like I said, there are the extreme examples where you might get some pushback, but most people and most stories and most of the time you're going to get some inspiration. It's not going to be that radical. But how you go about it and how you try to stand on the shoulders of others is where the radicalness will come through. Tip number five is commit to the chair. And this is the most important thing. You need to put in those 10,000 hours no matter what. If you want to be great, if you want to be remembered, if you want your book, excuse me, your books to be on the shelf long after you're dead, you have to show up, show up and put in the work. Unless you are lucky, unless you fall into whatever marketing scheme the book publishers are trying to push out during that year, you are going to have to write so well that you cannot be denied. With the declining reading rate, book publishing companies are getting forced more and more to not publish like avant-garde or like really high level literary fiction. The New York Times recently published an article that said that 98% of authors who published a book in 2020 sold less than 5,000 copies and if you guys know royalty rates that means that 98 percent of authors who published with a an established health house made less than ten thousand dollars and if we're talking about writing something that's magnificent and spending a thousand plus hours on it you know it's way less than minimum wage but writing has never been about money that's one of the worst things that happened to the novel is that when serial novels and airport novels really started blowing up people started doing it just for money and when you look at the poetry community for example until maybe very in the last decade and a half it's been relatively untouched by money. You know, if you got your PhD or if you fit once again into the certain role that the publishers wanted to market that year, maybe you could sell some books and be bad like Rupi Carr. But most of the time, poets, you know, know they're not gonna make any money and they write a book that they really wanna write. They are very genuine voices. But now, once again, for most of us, if we want to be remembered and make an impact, we're, we can't do it for the money, we can't be thinking about it in terms of money, and we have to be authors, not for the aesthetic, because doing something for aesthetic wastes time and energy, but doing it either because we really love it and we know the impact that will have on people. We know our story is an important and necessary one. Almost every single book getting published on Kindle, on the Kindle graveyard right now, is not that meaningful or necessary. But you and I aren't like that. We're going to do something great. I believe in you. So tip number six, so commit to the chair. If you sit down, I have a sign right now over my over my writing desk over here and says, you take care of the quantity and the quality will be taken care of. You show up and put the hours in, the quality will take care of itself. Number six, and you know, honestly, a lot of these are very common. Discard what's not working. A big ego thing that happens with writers, especially if you're self-publishing or like you got your husband or wife or your best friend editing your work. You have to be able to see and discard what's not working. You have to read. And the only way that you can know this is to be very well read. And if you were very, very well read, then you would not dare publish something that at least does not approach some of your idols work. And that's how I can tell that most people today who are writing books are either just doing it for the money or just for the aesthetic, or they just don't read it all because they don't understand that they are writing in a whole, they're writing like a bunch of middle schoolers relative to the greats in their chosen genre. And I know that people have to start somewhere, but most people like for for instance, like me, you know, you might write multiple novels and not publish them. I know it's a crazy concept. I've written multiple novels and sent them out. Never got published. Maybe I'll self-publish them, them one day. Maybe not though. I viewed all of it as practice. I know an author who now makes her living as a full-time literary fiction author, and she had to write 11 novels before the 11th one got published. The other 10, I've never seen the light of day. They all got sent out to hundreds of publishers. But her 11th novel, her debut novel is really good and it won a bunch of awards. And now she has a, she's a creative writing professor, mostly because of how good this book was and how big of a splash that it made. But she didn't find any of that success. She was just working as a salesman at Guitar Center until she was in her early thirties. Do you have that type of dedication though? You know, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people don't. And even if things aren't good, if it's not innovative in some way, and a lot of people think their story is innovative. They have this crazy story. It's like, hey, what if the Kraken took over Denver and everyone's on drugs? Whoa, such a cool idea. Yeah. Yes, it's unique, but is the style, is the writing, is the syntax, is the general flow of it all unique? Even just a little bit. And if it is, then let's go ahead, you know, go ahead and send it out to the world. But you need to discard what's working. Number seven is writers are people who finish books. Once again, you have to finish a book and you really have to send it out. I don't consider myself a novelist because I've never released a novel. I've written a bunch of novels. I've been writing novels for 13 or 14 years now. I've released a thousand plus blog posts. I've released at least 50 short stories online or in journals. Same with poetry. I'm a poet, blogger, and short story author. But I'm really not a novelist yet because I haven't shipped that work. I haven't done the most important thing and that's giving it to the world. So I guess I can say I'm a writer and publishing something online. This is what Rushdie says. Most things online are very rushed. Honestly, if you look at most blog posts and most things that are self-published online in any capacity, they seem very rushed and aren't that professional. So if you want to take it to the next level, you have to finish books. And if you don't care if they're good or bad, you are a writer nonetheless if you release them because most people will never release a book. So now we are moving on to Salman Rushdie's ideas on editing. And his first is that you should do a little bit of editing when you write. This is kind of a little bit Hemingway-esque that you should 
start the day and read what you've written, edit it a little bit, and then start writing. But you should only do a little bit because there's so many ADHD, OCD people, perfectionists out there, out here in our achievement society, who will never finish something or never reach their true potential because they're over editing the entire time. And when you're over editing, especially in the first draft or creative process, you start to iron out some of that rawness and the creativity and some of the natural syntax. And that's even the same for the end of the novel. If it just gets edited to death and everything becomes perfect, then everything, some of that magic starts falling apart. So Rushdie, like most people most of us edit a little bit as we go along but he does his first major edit at the end when he finishes his first draft so after a big first pass and edit we could call it a second draft really maybe maybe making a second draft he does a line in and that's a really a sentence by sentence word by word edit this is very common right then you go through it and you make sure that everything makes sense everything is good this takes a very long time if you have a hundred thousand world novel man this is an absolute grind but it's really not this is actually I actually like revising so much because this is when actually the story comes about. This is once again what separates good writers from bad writers. This is where polarity, syntax, deactivation of verbs and stories and characters all can start coming together. You can never do that on the first draft or even the second draft. You have to edit these sentences one by one. You can start comparing the sentence to the paragraph, the paragraph to the chapter, and start doing some crazy contrast. Uh, feel, read it out loud, see what it sounds like. All these things are very important. Next, Rushdie's Rushdie reads it chapter by chapter. And then after reading a chapter, he basically asks like, what happened in this chapter? And he writes a basic outline. He then writes a basic outline for each chapter. Then he looks at the outlines and reads it and sees you can, and he says, you can tell, and I've never done this before. He tells you that you'll see what's not working. There'll be some bloat. There'll be some stuff that is too thin. You'll see the areas. It's almost like a movie. You're almost reading like a script or like a general outline. You're like, okay, the plot on Wikipedia, what's up and what's down. And then from there, you can maybe go in and edit some more. Then his advice is just to shelf it. Stephen King does this. A lot of people do this. And that's where I was. So the title of this video was he, he helped me finish a book. And my most recent novel has been on the shelf since maybe last February when I finished this kind of process right here. But some of the book recommendations that we're about to look at right here, and then I, when I took this course a couple weeks back, I reread some of the recommendations that we'll be talking about and it actually inspired me because my book has some surreal elements to it. And I got some inspiration from some of those books that he recommended. And now I am in the process of hopefully revising my final draft. And that's what the last step is, is that you need to basically maybe go through all these steps again after you have some fresh eyes on it. And then when you are done with that, at some point in here, Rushti says that you should not show your work to people until it is ready, ready, until you are ready to have any idea dismantled. There, no, Because if you show people too early, it can ruin the creative process. It can take the energy away. So he starts giving it to people very late in the game. And I would agree with this too, especially. So if we're where we're at right now, let's say we've done about three drafts. So then if you give it to some people and they hand it back and you go through a similar process, and then maybe you do it again and hand it back to them with those major revisions then we're looking at like five drafts right here that's a that's a pretty good number for most people like i said if you do a major first draft um do a second draft i mean like do a whole just revamp of in second draft then you do a whole line edit that's really a whole draft if you go through every single line and really focus line by line then if you maybe go so we're already that was the third draft then the fourth draft um at, before that you do your chapter outline and then you um shelf it and then maybe you do the whole all those steps again so that's the fourth draft and then the fifth draft and sixth draft would be maybe if you have two um Two, two drafts of correspondence with your peers. So five or six drafts. And once again, you, you guys, will it will work wonders for your work. And if that book doesn't work out, the things that you learn will make your next novel so much better during just that five or six draft revising process. And then it's ready. Then if you're, you know, um, publishing with a big house and it's going to get sent off and be published even more, and that's how the greats are so great. We looked at the first, second, third, fourth draft of a lot of the, our favorite books. They wouldn't look very good. They would absolutely suck. Once they've gone through your own process and the editing process, is, it's absolutely insane. So now let's talk about some of Salman Rushdie's favorite surrealist books, very surreal books. And this is an absolutely banger of a list. So the first one is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This is just an absolute classic dystopian surreal text. And this one is very good. I mean, you know, everyone, I don't want to, I'm not going to rail any of these ones to death, except maybe some of the obscure, obscure ones you haven't heard about. Handmaid's Tale is so good because it presents such a scary speculative fiction reality that's only a couple steps away from this one. And it seems somewhat probable because men are crazy. Women's rights, you know, for instance, abortion rights are always teetering, even today. And how that collapses and what that turns into is then where the story begins. And Margaret Atwood, as an expert writer, you know, does a beautiful job with everything else that follows. And that's, once again, that's where the real creativity comes in. If you're doing surreal or speculative fiction, if you see something, if you see a big problem or a big potential, like what we just talked about, men being crazy and women's rights not seeming that stable. The real story happens once you've identified and that that's where push comes to shove because the layers and the deepness 
that Atwood shows is what carries the story. There's been a lot of stories where men are taking over a society and abusing women. Most don't have an expert writer behind it like Atwood. Next, we have Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. And this is one of the best books ever. And it is really, really weird because it is very early Mexican surrealist fiction. And it may take a couple different reads because it's really campy and old. And some of the things aren't that well executed because it's a time shifting novel. It's about this haunted village and this man who's going through death and life and stories. And like, it's very psychedelic and surreal, but it's so raw and so good because it was first published in 1995. And that was very, very innovative. It's very postmodern and deep when that really wasn't a thing. So you start to see like what it was like, like the people who were experiencing Seeing that more psychedelic or schizophrenic consciousness back in the 50s because obviously there were some how they were writing and this one is a classic everyone needs to check this one out i promise you it would leave you with a weird feeling it is a little bit of a slog but it's also very short like 125 pages and it, like the book is small too like it's not it's not more than like 50,000 words so next on the list we have kindred by octavia butler and octavia butler is honestly one of the best science fiction writers around and on top of that she was an absolute icon and trailblazer for african-american authors not just in this especially obviously in the science fiction world but just in general because like i rank her up there with a, a tony morrison but she was just more innovative and it, it was sad that she died a very early death and i don't know this i've always wanted to say this that i had a professor and she specialized in octavia butler and i took this class with her and then i went to office hours i always always go to your office, professor's office hours and talk to them and she met and we were talking and i mentioned somehow like the early death and she said it was so bad that they did that to her and i was like what did what to her and she was like oh oh no no you don't need to worry about that right now let's not talk about that and i i, I think she was referencing that octavia there was a conspiracy a conspiracy theory revolving around octavia butler's death and this girl did her phd on octavia butler and i'm just telling you what i heard anyway the best work by octavia butler is her book the parable of the silver it's one of my favorite dystopian novels but kindred is really good because it takes a modern woman 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 and transports her back to ante the antebellum and she's an african-american so obviously she's going she's enslaved and it's a very good depiction of slavery and the process and adds fantasy elements in it's really up there with like charles uh, johnson's the oxherding tale for the books i've read that revolve around slavery and once again it adds some surrealism to the story parable in the sower though by octavia butler is a banger because it takes place in southern california and it's another one of those books that i think that's even more realistic than handmaid's tale by far like this could actually happen like if shit got bad this is exactly what would happen in places like southern california so next we have franz kafka's the metamorphosis and this is the iconic classic surrealist text everyone ev these i recommend literally every single one of these books on this list is mind-blowing can change your life can help you take your writing to the next level and obviously the metamorphosis by franz kafka is one of the most influential books of all time it is in the canon for what it did for film and writing and art is absolutely unbelievable the ripples that that book that that book created or that story excuse me are surreal i did a video on this channel on the director david lynch's favorite books metamorphosis it's one of those books a lot of people maybe read in high school but think they don't need to read it again and it's something to study and cherish much like lots of franz kafka's works you know he is i think probably in my canon you know if i had to make a new canon and include a lot of the newer authors like the 20th century canon for sure he's one of the kings next we have a very interesting pick and i can't you know i i i applaud rushdie for picking controversial authors like gunter grass because gunter grass in his book the tin cup uh the tin drum excuse me have caused a lot of problems in the community because gunter grass was a nazi or at least had relations to hitler's youth and a bunch of other things and that got a lot of that got revealed later in his career but you know i I, I, and I think Rushdie probably understands cancel culture at some level and that like a good novel is a good novel and an innovator and a writer is a good writer. The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass is a very, very weird book, but it is one of the more high grade pieces of liter literary fiction that's been published in the last 75 years. And I would recommend it to everybody. And on this channel and another book review, I've been meaning to reread this one and do a book review. But this book is about a genderless planet. It's very good. Can't give away too much without spoiling it. But Ursula K. Le Guin is a science fiction master and she's one of the best female science fiction writers of all time up there with Octavia Butler. Next, we have Beloved by Toni Morrison. And this really could be considered more. I mean, I understand how it's surreal because it's a, a trauma narrative. And Toni Morrison is one of the greatest American novelists of all time. And it's obviously a master. And I always say this when I talk about Toni Morrison. She started writing later in her life. She was juggling multiple kids, a job, and she woke up very early and wrote. There are no excuses to not become the best writer that you can be. Octavia Butler was in a similar situation, having to wake up really early and juggle a, a normal job and kids and 
Where is your dedication? Haruki Mirakami, which we're going to be talking about next. We get home from work every night at like 12 and write till 4 a.m. and then sleep seven hours and do it all over again while running his own business. And that brings us to Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Mirakami. And this is my favorite book on this list. If I had to choose one for you to read, go read Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Mirakami. He's an absolute master of contemporary magical realism or surrealism. This is the most recent book on the list other than The Handmaid's Tale. And I like Mirakami because his books are speculative, but they don't go toward uh, the dystopian reality. And they don't, I don't even know if they go toward a utopian reality. They go into a more of a magical reality that maybe if you've taken psychedelics or into occultism or spirituality may seem kind of probable. And that's why it's, he's a really cool author. All of his works are really good. And Kafka on the Shore is about a young man who runs away from his home, who is being raised by a single father, runs away from home. He comes into a town. And from there, a major mystery and story unfolds. It's very weird. It's very trippy. There are always, always some very bizarre sex scenes in Mirakami books. And just this magical light language. He's very Hemingway-esque. It's very light. A lot of the characters don't seem to have that much depth to it, but if you look underneath the surface, it's almost like the iceberg theory with Mirakami. There's so much available. So last but not least, we have Dr. Che Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Frankenstein. Both are very good books, and both are underrated in the sense that you can read them, especially Frankenstein. And Frankenstein still holds up for when it was written. You can read it and it make sense. It doesn't read like a classic novel. You can read through it and the language isn't too like bourgeoisie or anything. I had to reread Frankenstein. I did a major paper on it, pairing um, Frankenstein to German idealism and um, the idea of the creative genius. And I got that work published in some journal that probably like 30 people read and of those 30, 30 people got and of those 30 people, who knows how many actually read it. But nonetheless, Frankenstein is an absolutely potent book, has so many different interpretations and it is like the queen text of surrealism. So if you guys like this breakdown, go check out some of my other author tips over here. And thanks for joining. Peace.